Well, thanks very much for your interest in learning more about true sustainability. I'm Dave Gardner. I produced and directed the documentary Growth Busters Hooked on Growth about our culture's relentless and unsustainable pursuit of growth. After the film was released in 2011, I decided to continue growth busting. I produced several short films, which you can see on the Growth Busters YouTube channel. I evangelize whenever someone puts up a tent and invites me, thank you, to the Intermountain Sustainability Summit for this tent. I also host the Growth Busters podcast about sustainable living. Now, the question on the table today is, what keeps the growth imperative entrenched in our culture? Well, what is culture? Culture is the sum of our customs, attitudes, and beliefs. A university has a culture. Companies have their own culture. Nations do. And our modern society has a culture. Culture has tremendous inertia. You don't change culture overnight. Over the millennia, we've preserved our culture by telling stories. Culture was passed on this way from one generation to the next. We don't spend much time telling stories around the actual campfire today, but we have lots of ways of sharing stories. Pundits on late night TV and cable news networks, and the brags and promises made by elected officials and political candidates. So these constitute today's campfire, and that campfire plays a key role in either maintaining or changing our culture. Today, we have a culture of growth, a culture that believes more is better. We're obsessed with growth. We're convinced that more is better. Bigger is better. Growth is good. Growth leads to prosperity. We have a very special love affair going with economic growth. The truth is, we worship GDP growth. We believe there's a pot of gold at the end of the growth rainbow. Why is this a problem? Well, very briefly, it's a problem because the behavior driven by that culture of growth that belief system is unsustainable. Growing levels of consumption, economic activity, and population are disrupting our climate, deforesting the planet, killing its biodiversity, pumping major rivers and aquifers dry, and toxifying our air, water, and soil. Growth in the scale of the human enterprise pushed us beyond the capacity of the biosphere around 1970. Have you wondered what's keeping us from bringing that red line humanity's footprint back down beneath the green line, which is the biocapacity of the planet. We've been repeatedly informed of this situation by the scientific community, yet our society has done virtually nothing to change course. Why? What keeps us from doing what's necessary? It's our culture, our civilization-wide belief in the universal goodness of growth. And every day we sit around the campfire and hear the same stories about the goodness of growth. Daily we are served drink after drink of the Kool-Aid that keeps us believing the unsustainable myth of perpetual prosperity from never-ending growth. It's as if we were sleep learning, you know, where you go to bed and you put on headphones and all night you play something that you want driven into your brain. Our bedtime stories start programming us with the growth is good myth when we're young. And once we've bought into that belief system, it reinforces the beliefs day in, day out. I was impressed Greta Thunberg recognized these fairy tales for what they are. All you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? What's the campfire telling us about the economy? Economic growth is good. Not only is it good, but it is physically possible for it to continue into eternity. Now related to this notion of the goodness of robust economic growth is the notion of the goodness of increasing consumption, rising retail sales, increasing housing starts, more automobiles being manufactured and purchased. These are all treated by all our cultural messengers as good news. Even though you and I know that increasing levels of consumption are bad news for our life supporting ecosystems. What's the campfire telling us about population? Population growth for a country means more workers and consumers, a growing economy. Population growth for a city, metro area or state is a sign of success and leads to economic growth, 
bigger tax base, more jobs. Well, let me share some examples of how the campfire is perpetuating the myth of the goodness of eternal economic growth. We get this growth is awesome message on magazine covers, in webinars and self-help books, when we log into our bank accounts, who doesn't want their nest egg to grow, and in reporting on the economy. First, let's just look at the headlines. Now note the judgment here, that 3% GDP growth is good news. This isn't an opinion piece, it's news reporting. The headline, US economy starts with a whimper. And the caption under the photo, economy slowed to one of the weakest paces. Whimper and weak imply that this is bad news. Here, the headline is, Canada growth risks lagging U.S. as exports cool. Clearly, there's a competition, and Canada wants its economy growing faster than the U.S. Strong economy, weaker growth. The judgment here is clear. Headline here, a picture of healthy growth. This story is about business revenue growth, but that's clearly a contributor to consumption and economic growth. Healthy growth. Who thinks they're talking here about zero growth? In our overshoot situation, the only healthy growth would be degrowth, a contracting economy. You'd be right to expect pro-growth bias and propaganda from a chamber of commerce, but I'm sharing this to underscore some of the language we use without even stopping to think. The chamber said their citizen of the year has dedicated his life to helping Moab grow and prosper grow and prosper. That phrase is used all the time. Even more common, according to Google, is grow and thrive. I could have predicted what the new Oakdale mayor would say. It has always been my hope to see our town grow and thrive. In this commentary by the mayor of Carlsbad, New Mexico, Dale Janway, the mayor wrote, one of the greatest accomplishments of the past years has to be the completion of the double legal water system. The completion of this project gives the city of Carlsbad and its residents the ability to grow and thrive in a desert environment. Headline here, U.S. economy grows at its strongest pace in two years. The subhead, after a dismal first half. Bill McKibben, most famous these days as one of the founders of 350.org, described this very aptly in my documentary, Growth Busters. No one thinks twice when they turn on the news and the theoretically objective newscaster begins each economic piece of economic news by saying, good news today on the economic front, the economy has grown larger. He never comes on and says, bad news today on the economic front, housing starts are up 12%, even though you could just as easily make the argument that the next increment of subdivisions is bad news as much as good. Um, we've reached the point where the economy and its growth patterns are extremely real to us. We, even the language that we use to talk about them is suggestive. The economy is ailing. The economy has had a setback. The economy is in recovery. Um, you know, this is something that we very tender about, much more tender now than we are about the natural world that encompasses it. Here's a headline, Federal Reserve sees worse economic growth in the next four years. If you were to run this news by an economist in the degrowth movement, or let's say Brian Check at the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy, they wouldn't characterize slower growth as worse. Here, a higher rate of GDP growth is better. And it's not just the headlines. Here is the language used by the Associated Press financial writer in this story. The U.S. economy grew at a solid 2.9% annual rate. It's the strongest nine-month stretch of growth in a dozen years. Wednesday's revision, the government's third and final look at GDP in the quarter, was better than analysts had been expecting. It's extremely powerful because the goodness of growth is presented as unquestioned. Of course, everlasting economic growth is what we want. Of course, our city must grow. Whenever the Associated Press reports on the latest GDP growth figures, we get a quote praising the growth from an economist at the Federal Reserve or at one of the big investment banks. 
the reporter hasn't sought out an expert with an alternative and, frankly, more informed opinion. The assumption is, we all agree, rising GDP is a very good thing. The White House website featured this story. And look at the quote, three straight quarters of healthy growth. Economic growth is also reported as an area of competition among nations, states, and cities. The implication here is that the faster the growth, the better your nation, state, or city. It's not just the news programming us to perpetuate the myths. It's rampant in political speeches and campaign slogans. I'm showing this particular politician because his re-election hopes were entirely predicated on robust economic growth. Why did he try to minimize the COVID pandemic? Because a rational response to the pandemic would pause, even reverse, economic growth. He couldn't have that. Trump was far from the first or only politician to promise, promote, and pursue growth. And the reporting on elections backs the politicians up on this mythology. So we all assume we want the candidate who will somehow put more money in all our pockets next year. As we speak, governors are creating economic growth panels and commissions. You might think this is perfectly understandable as a response to the devastation of COVID on our economy. I'll just say a truly enlightened response would be to create an economic health commission. Job creation is closely tied to economic growth, and it's harder to argue that it's not a good thing. We want everyone to have meaningful work and an income so they can meet their needs. But if we have to grow the economy to give everyone a job, that's problematic. Why do we have to grow the economy to have full employment? because the population is growing. Of course, every politician promises to create jobs and grow the economy while on the campaign trail. And a lot of that job creation and economic growth is sought by luring companies to move to your state or city. While that doesn't alter the ecological footprint of humanity, it does increase your local or regional footprint, and it keeps the growth mindset ensconced in our culture. Trump's final chief economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, has long been one of the biggest purveyors of growth snake oil. Take a look at three of his most recent books. This would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. City leaders want to sustain economic growth forever, so they call that sustainability. Reporting on jobs has all the same issues. Is this good news or bad? Clearly, it can be complicated. The COVID pandemic has shuttered businesses and shrunk the workforce. All those affected need jobs. But once the economy is humming again, the assumption will remain that job creation is all positives and no negatives. Next, a few examples of how the campfire is perpetuating the myth of the goodness of increasing consumption. This headline says it's a positive sign housing starts surpass 1 million in March. The headline writers clearly assume it's inarguable that more housing starts is something positive. In the story, Paul Ashworth, chief U.S. economist at Capital Economics, called the data obviously good news. This AP story illustrates another aspect of the problem. Who are the experts sought out for a quote? Chief economist at Capital Economics, an economics research consultancy largely owned by Lloyd's Banking Group and Phoenix Equity Partners. Brian Robick, managing member of Fairfield-based RG Builders. There's no quote from an ecological economist or an environmentalist who might interpret over 1 million housing starts as bad news because of the loss of forest or farmland that's being converted into subdivisions. For 15 years, I've been watching this. I found this complete absence of alternative viewpoints in story after story about economic growth, retail, construction, etc. 100% of the time in mainstream media. Here's another typical Housing Starts headline. Housing market a drag on economic growth. But the real harm here is the reporting on the economy, not the housing market. The AP reporter wrote that economic growth of 1.6% is the worst in more than three years. This is presented as news, not opinion. 
Now, I clipped this story in 2006, 15 years ago, but nothing about this phenomenon has changed. No wonder so few of us are aware that economic growth is in fundamental conflict with sustainability. Here's the same story as reported by another global news service, Reuters. Housing weakness bashes down GDP. It couldn't be more clear. Here the headline is, November retail sales encouraging. Now, November is when we have Black Friday and Cyber Monday, when all eyes are on sales numbers. More is always reported as better. It treats increased sales as good news. It assumes there is universal agreement about that, even though it means more natural resources were extracted, more carbon emissions, and more stuff in the landfill next year. Note the advertisement on this site. Classic Homes, a home builder. Do you think that advertiser wants to see honest reporting about the unsustainability of increasing consumption? Here, a plunge in vehicle registrations is not as bad as during the Great Recession. Well, a plunge is bad for the auto dealers and manufacturers and the workers at the plants. But that plunge is great for our ecological footprint, the planet's stock of natural resources and climate stability. On a grand scale, the news reporting and policymaker position on the goodness of increasing consumption is all tied to that slave master they all bow to, economic growth. Let's see how the campfire is perpetuating the myth of the goodness of population growth. It's fairly obvious how economic growth has so much appeal, but what about population growth? As we settled the wild frontier in North America, there were many benefits for settlements growing into towns, towns into cities. Today, after a couple of centuries where growth seemed to be all good, it's just become a habit. Almost everyone assumes growth of their city is progress and leads to prosperity for all. Look at the reporting on population. Cities are addicted to growth, suffering from the delusion that increasing population is a sign of success. But do reporters approach this with any objectivity? No, they've bought into the competition and the false metric of success. Here, Dallas was leading the nation, implying there's a competition and the winner is the city growing the fastest. This competition to have the fastest growing population is the subject of a lot of news reports whenever the US Census Bureau releases the latest population estimates for cities or states. And slowing growth or no growth, is that good news or bad? Slow population growth is characterized as anemic. Shouldn't slowing growth or even contraction be good news in an overpopulated world? But no, it's consistently reported as bad news. Over the past two years, declining birth rates have been a big news story. And that is, in every case I've found, reported as bad news. At best, it's challenging. Time and again, headlines and news stories are referring to it as a baby bust. Depopulation panic is rearing its ugly head among big businesses and the hired gun economists at their think tanks, plus politicians. Journalists, unfortunately, are spreading and reinforcing the myth that a contracting population is more bad news than good. There are a growing number of places experiencing population decline. That's a positive trend, and we'll see more and more of it during this century. But here's how it's being reported. It's something that needs to be fixed. Sadly, for policymakers programmed from birth to believe that fairy tale of infinite growth, the fix is to somehow interrupt this trend that we should all be welcoming. Now, this is a column, not a news story, so it's not quite as insidious as the reporting that makes the unexamined assumption about the badness of the end of growth. Here's the connection. The belief is that population growth is good because that means economic growth. This headline and report are from a public television station, a fairly progressive news source. This growthism is not exclusive to conservative media. It's everywhere. Here's a typical population growth headline. Population thrives. That doesn't mean it's contracting to a sustainable level, even though that would actually meet the more enlightened definition of thriving, healthy, doing well, instead of 
growing vigorously or gaining in wealth or possessions. What do politicians have to say on the subject of population? In this commentary by retired five-term Idaho state legislator Stephen Hartkin, he states, If Idaho is so poorly led, why have we had a 16% population growth in the decade, one of the best in the nation? Shouldn't we be seeing more headlines and reporting like this? Yes, but at present, this is a one-in-a-million outlier. The problem with the ever-expanding scale of the human enterprise is that its pros and cons are not being actively debated in the mainstream. This is the really insidious thing about it being our culture. The universal goodness of growth is a given. It's not up for debate. No one even thinks it should be. The goodness of growth is an unexamined assumption. With these campfire conversations, it's no wonder we're stuck in a culture of growth. The late Eric Zensi got it. He called it infinite planet bias. He wrote this in a piece called Toward a Finite Planet Journalism for the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. This is the right kind of thinking, but I would delete the word environmental. We don't need environmental journalism that stops telling us fairy tales of eternal economic growth. We need all journalism to stop perpetuating the myths. The main reason I want to highlight the pro-growth fairy tales we're telling ourselves is to take away their power over you. As a filmmaker, early in my career, I learned about changeover cues for projectionists. Before the projection booth was automated, there was a uh, visual cue in the upper right-hand corner of the frame. I think it was seven seconds before it was time to switch over from one reel of the movie to the next. It was to alert the projectionist to fire up that second projector. Well, once I learned about that, I always saw it. I couldn't enjoy a movie and completely be absorbed by the film. I always saw that changeover cue right before each reel changed. It's similar with this cultural propaganda. Now that I've brought it to your attention, it will be painfully obvious to you when you see it. It no longer has power over you. I have freed you from the tyranny of these deadly fairy tales. So you're welcome. Several years ago, I launched a project called Growth Bias Busted, and you can still find the website, growthbiasbusted.org, where we had a wall of fame and a wall of shame, and we shared examples on the wall of shame of this kind of pro-growth bias in the media. The Growth Busters Project, like the film, focuses attention on both the overpopulation and the overconsumption issue, the entire sustainability equation. At growthbusters.org, you can find the podcast, sign up for email updates, order bumper stickers, small family stickers, or t-shirts to start the conversations we need to have. I'm really looking forward now to questions and discussion, but if we can't get to all the questions and comments today, feel free to email me.